Hello and welcome to the CyberLive virtual stage. Today I'm going to be joined with Stephen Sim, who's the Chief Information Security Officer at PSA International. He's going to be presenting us with his keynote presentation entitled Architecting Cybersecurity Against Emerging Threats in Industry 4.0. Stephen has worked for more than 24 years in the cybersecurity field with large end user enterprise enterprises and critical infrastructures. He regularly shares his thoughts on cyber risk and security speaking at both international and local conferences. He also guest lectures at Institutes of High Learning and has many published articles. Holding a number of cyber related accreditations, Stephen is also a member of the Cyber Ed Board community, Microsoft APAC CISO Council and Cyber Reason Cyber Defenders Council. Welcome Stephen. Thank you, Tali. Um, I'll pass over to you now for your presentation. Sure, thank you. Um, good day, everyone. Thank you for having me and giving me, giving me this opportunity to present Architecting Cybersecurity Against Emerging Threats in Industry 4.0. So in the next um, 20 minutes or so, which is not a lot of time, I'm going to only discuss the key areas and considerations in Industry 4.0 and predominantly Supply Chain 4.0. So before I begin, I just wish to highlight the usual disclaimer that the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are entirely my own and do not necessarily reflect the official position of any organization. Now, supply chain 4.0 refers to essentially a supply chain ecosystem with underlying industry 4.0 deployments. The building of smart cities has, has accelerated OT and IT and I increasingly both of them are converging for predictive analytics. Autonomous vehicles are being tested and deployed. Automation also increases risk because it is the means to repeat human errors with rigor in a consistent manner. Right. So in fact, later on, I'm going to share more about this. In smart cities, we need to understand OT, IoT, and IoT as they are widely used for sensing automation, analytics, decision making, and so on and so forth. Most of us know what OT is. OT stands for Operational Technology and encompasses ICS or Industrial Control Systems and SCADA or Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition Systems. Essentially, these are critical equipment that has an impact to safety. If you are taking the lift to work, you are already putting your lives on OT. Why do we need to care so much about OT in smart cities? Because they are heavily interconnected, such as our intelligent buildings, management systems. And what happens when we go smart is that increasingly we moved from OT, which is originally built with the intent to be in closed networks, now increasingly connected to the internet, hence becoming essentially critical. And for IoT, which is not so critical, becoming used in more critical functions and therefore have to be considered in terms of the risk that it imposes on the whole ecosystem. So what you see on this slide and the following slide are the possible threat scenarios and avenues of attacks across the supply chain 4.0. So these are, it can be bridged at the containers, it can be bridged uh, on the smart equipment and so forth. Does any of you recognize this? This is an automated guided vehicle or AGV on trial, which I tested many years ago in my previous role. Just sending unexpected input causes the entire AGV to lock up. It was unable to recover by itself. You have to be physically present at the AGV to press the fat big red button at its side to allow it to reset itself. Turns out that the vendor had left an undocumented developer backdoor, which was not adequately protected. They only fixed it after I told them I have intention to escalate to US cert as part of responsible disclosure for new vulnerabilities. So in a closed network, the risk is definitely lower. But what happens when you need to expose 
your networks for analytics such as predictive analytics. A quick question to everyone. How easy is it to be a hacker? Can a nine-year-old kid become a hacker overnight? Yes, in fact, he can by simply Googling at two key websites. The first is the NVD on National Vulnerability Database. Over here, I have nothing against Schneider Electric, but I'm just using them as an example. And this example can also be seen in other vendors as well. I use the example of a Schneider Electric structure where building automations, building operations automation server over here. From here, you can tell that the version that is vulnerable is 1.7 or lower. Notice that the exploit kit is available for download. So now, as a nine year old, I have the exploit. But how do I know what the vulnerability systems, vulnerable systems are? Where are they that I can attack? What are their domain names or IP addresses? Well, the nine year old doesn't need to fret too much about that. There is a search engine for every purpose, whether it is about crawling the dark web, the dark net, or simply searching for vulnerable systems. It is affectionately known as Shodan, spelled as S-H-O-D-A-N. You can visit the website, www.shodan.io, and simply register an account and use it to check your company's footprint exposed to the internet without actively performing port scans or vulnerability scans. So recall, a few slides ago, at the NVD database, I have downloaded the exploit targeting the structure where building automations, autom building operations automation server. By keying in various versions on Shodan, I can now pinpoint exactly what are the IP addresses I can attack and successfully bridge these systems using the exploit that I have downloaded. It is really as simple as that. Of course, I'm not encouraging you to do that. This tool is useful for checking your organization's internet facing footprint and posture health. And often you do not even need to bother yourselves to spend time to research a vulnerability or download and exploit. Here's an example. Busybox is a, Busybox is a very popular operating system used by many IoT equipment. Those of you who have played around with Unix or Linux before will know that hash meant good access. In this case, you don't even need to log in at all. This whole exercise is to illustrate how the barriers of entry have really been greatly lowered in this day and age. How then can we future-proof our smart equipment? And we must not forget physical to cyber threats. Here are a few examples. GPS can be easily spoofed. So you are relying on GPS heavily in your architecture. You need to consider land-based backup navigation systems. And it's often no longer adequate to look at cyber architecture. It is also important to look at the physical setup as well. For instance, do you lock down the USB port to protect against killer USBs, which can cause a short circuit at your equipment if connected? And my last example over here, another physical to cyber threat are drones. Even hobby drones can be used to effectively jam industrial access points. This is a tough problem to solve, and this is where integration of physical and cyber monitoring, integrated physical cyber socks becomes very important. Now we have discussed some of the key emerging threats with supply chain 4.0. Now let's discuss the impact to the business. If we remember our history lessons well, the NotPetya ransomware attack in 2017 resulted in massive damages. Merck, one of the biggest pharmaceuticals, had it worse, with damage cost claim of USD 1.3 billion. They bought cyber insurance, but unfortunately, many insurers do not ensure um, what is otherwise regarded as an act of war. This ensued into a legal dispute between the drug giant and its insurers. 
If companies out there still regard cyber insurance as a panacea, exorbitant premiums aside, we need to think again. As always, like I mentioned earlier, cyber insurance oftentimes come into most people's minds as the primary means to transfer risk as part of the enterprise overall risk treatment plan. In the case of Merck, cyber insurance payouts are an issue if the breach is considered or regarded as an act of war. To make things worse, the cost of cyber insurance has increased 32% last year and increased even more this year. The quotation you get today can be marked up for 25% within a couple of days. This is how volatile the situation has become as claims are up due to increasing number of ransomware victims. And coupling that limits out being reduced. Even one of the largest cyber insurers, AXA, had to stop reimbursing ransom payments to abide by regulatory compliance from the French government, as paying ransom seems to be akin to abetting such cybercrime. And then one knows what happened immediately after AXA stopped reimbursing ransom payments. They got breached. Okay. So how can we then future-proof supply chain 4.0, smart cities, and equipment against the threats that I mentioned earlier? In my experience, there are six key steps to governance and architecting. Firstly, to adopt a good IT risk management framework. Next, to perform threat modeling. Third, to adopt sound cybersecurity principles. Fourth, to adopt a robust cybersecurity framework. And then, culminating all these into key security controls and eventual architecture. The image you see here at bullet point six is the TOGAF architecture reference framework, but you could easily replace it with SAPSA or any other architecture reference framework as well. I'll just briefly cover through some of these areas before elaborating more on the architectural aspects. Ultimately, what is the objective of good governance and architecture? It is to enable the business. With that comes alignment with the organization's risk appetite. If your organization's risk appetite is low, then your architecture would have a lot more controls in place. However, it is also important not to overdo the controls. Therefore, I use the words risk optimization and not risk reduction or risk mitigation. Ownership of risk is important. Many folks within the organization may be responsible for deploying controls at different levels, but there should only be one risk owner being accountable and this risk owner holds the purse strings and decides the risk level and security investment to shoot for. And I shared uh, as well, there is no perfect security. Risk reduction or mitigation is a bottomless pit if we do not know when to stop. And which is where optimization comes into the picture because it tells us how much risk to strive for and to run a business, we need to take risk. And the only way to perfect cybersecurity is to avoid risk altogether. And that's simply not to run a business at all. Therefore, understanding the enterprise risk appetite and how IT and OT converging risk and IoT risk can be aligned to operational risk and business risk is a key step. The goalposts must be set in place first. Next, we need to know what we are up against. To really understand the tactics, techniques, and procedures or TTPs of attackers and design our architecture to address the threats at different levels of the architecture. Beyond the Lockheed Martin cyber queue chain, we can adopt the unified queue chain and the MITRE attack framework, as you can see on the slide itself. The MITRE attack framework runs through the various techniques of how the attacker can first gain a foothold into the organization before moving laterally and penetrating your crown jewels in your critical environment. And using the NotPetya wiper worm as an example, again, we first enter the organizational network through a watering hole attack on the update servers of a trusted piece of accounting software. Then it elevated its privileges through stealing domain administrator passwords through Mimikatz memory credential stealing software before moving laterally through not just exploitation of vulnerabilities, but also foulness or leaving of the land forms of propagation in the likes of PSXZ 
and WMIC calls, which are all traversing over TCP port 445. When I assess a solution architecture in my job, I ask solution vendors to provide me a mapping of their efficacy against preventing or detecting the different techniques under the MITRE attack framework and to ensure that the solution is complementary so as to allow me a large coverage of the attacker's modus operandi. Key security principles have major influences onto your architecture. They are primarily secure by design, secure by default, secure in deployment and communications. Secure by design covers from using getting user requirements, identifying asset criticality to tender specifications and determining the right architecture. It is difficult to redo the architecture after everything has been deployed in place. The processes secure by default, secure by design uh, deployment are equally important because security is a journey and the cybersecurity posture deteriorates over time if they are not correctly maintained. Finally, risk communications is the most important piece to communicate and align risk appetite and management from strategic to tactical to operational levels. Following that, adopt a cybersecurity framework such as NIS or ISO or COVID, which amalgamates and covers all these standards. Using this CSF as an example, the architecture of smart cities have to focus a lot more on detection, response, and recovery. And the reason is because breaches are inevitable. It is about being able to detect, respond, contain, and recover fast. Now, how can we contain a sensor and limit its impact once it's breached? That is food for thought, which I'll share more later on. Next, we need to determine the key security controls. For cyber physical systems, which encompasses OT and IoT, in my experience, the key cyber security controls that needs to be addressed are in these eight areas, predominantly physical security, change management, network security, security hardening, account management, vulnerability management, incident management, and last but not least, security awareness. Many of these bubbles translates into architecture design such as network security, vulnerability management, and incident management. Network security should be based on layered defenses by depth and by sufficient diversity. Minimally diversity between security zones or tiers, such as the use of two different makes of firewalls. NIST SPA 100-82 R2 is very useful architecture guidance for OT and you should read it if you are involved in securing OT and converging them for industry 4.0. Layer defenses are important so that you can hinder the attacker so much so that the action objectives in the MITRE attack framework cannot be achieved before you defend and fend off the attacker while it is on your network. There are many modes of layer defenses by layering at different OSI layers by technology my micro segmentation to self contain and support granular rules of active, or active defense. And active defense is especially important in an OT environment, which I'll share more later on. This slide is a further, further illustration of how you can control the entry points over the network and between hosts through the use of managed or orchestrated network and host based firewalls. The key entry vectors are physical bridge, USBs, and over the cyber network. Such vulnerabilities are often slow to becoming patched in OT and IoT environments. Therefore, it's important to use security gateways or jump holes to shield those vulnerabilities away. Again, having firewall rules through a micro segmentation or micro segmentation through a zero trust approach would prevent a worm from spreading and end up as an outbreak. It limits the blast radius. Think about COVID-19. The cases that happen in the cruise ship is a good segmentation. Look at NotPetya. It took seven minutes to compromise 45,000 endpoints and 4,000 servers. Could that have been prevented using a zero trust approach? My take is yes. Because NotPetya uses lateral movement through log bins in the likes of fileless attacks in PowerShell, PS, etc. You might see to laterally move using Microsoft SMB protocols. Applying zero trust 
could simply adopt a host-based firewall rules into your HMIs. It doesn't need expensive solutions, u 2one next and so forth. If you can't afford them, use uh, uh, host-based firewall rules to achieve similar effects to prevent a widespread ransomware attack. The cyber world, like the real world, is dealing with irresistible force paradox. It is a constant step up, step up game between attackers and defenders. When you build a stronger shield, an attacker will come up with a stronger spear. There is no foolproof cybersecurity, and it's a constant tug of war and stepping up game between cyber attackers and defenders. Cyber criminals are using machine learning and even deep learning as well, and it appears that they are outpacing cyber defenders in its use. Therefore, as cyber defenders, we need to step up our game and build a stronger shield, a stronger defense. And in our defenses, it is important to focus on an assumed breach approach. It is not a matter of if, but when incidents will happen. And this relates to the notion of zero trust, where you don't trust even your own networks and your own machines. Assuming that they are already breached and focus on detection, recovery and resilience. Right? So it is inevitable to have a breach, but it is not inevitable in terms of the ability to detect, contain a breach fast enough before significant business impact can result. So therefore, to sustain business, we need to be cyber resilient. And to do that, it is important to adopt an active cyber defense approach. To consume threat intelligence against this is through joining communities like ISACs, information sharing analysis centers, such as the OTI ISAC, where I have firsthand obtained non-public threat intelligence, ISACA, and others. Then being able to use this intelligence for monitoring and incident response, and then refining the posture of the environment, such as the adoption of zero trust architecture to limit the blast radius of attacks and making it easier to contain incidents. And therefore, uh, this will require technologies such as SIEM and beyond including the likes of EA, EDR, XDR, SOAR, security orchestration and automated response, and honeypots and honey tokens to serve as decoys and to build all this into an integrated UDA process on the slide itself. Security analytics using AI and ML becomes very important. A quick word about security analytics. Many of you would have been familiar with the World War II analysis of data by researchers at the Center for Naval Analysis. Based on the analysis, the solution to their problem was clear. Increase the armor on the plane's wings and body. But there was a problem. The analysis was completely wrong. Thankfully, before the planes are modified, a statistician reviewed the data and discovered that the researchers had only looked at bombers, which returned to base, but not on the planes that were shot down. So relying on the same data and noticing surviving bombers rarely had damage in the cockpit and so forth, um, they realized that the tail and the uh, parts of the tail and so forth, they are actually the most vulnerable areas on the entire plane. And with the new analysis, the crews reinforce um, the armor at the tail, the copy and the engines. Result was fewer fatalities, right? The story is a vivid example of survival bias. Survival bias is when we look at data only for those that succeed and exclude those that fail. So what is the moral of this story? Your, your solution might not be in what is there, but what is missing? Therefore, AI, ML are only as good as the data sets you feed them. So if you don't feed your SIEM or SOAR enough data, there will inevitably be more false negatives and false positives. I would like to end my presentation by a quick summary of key points. Supply chain 4.0 and smart cities are here to stay as we accelerate during pandemic and with industry 4.0. There is heavier reliance on cyber physical and data convergence, increased data concentration, and access through analytics and cloud adoption, and increased criticality on physical and wireless networking. And transiting to this cybersecurity normal is the need for better converged monitoring, impact analysis, and automated containment. There needs to be elevated security requirements and mandates such as uh, in integrated security and privacy by design across the supply chain. We've increased the common, uh, and a point of um, importance is that all these are 
not useful if we don't look at resilience and focus on that. All in all, whatever that is evergreen and future proving is good governance and it is key to good architecture. Architecture alone has to be supported by good governance, processes and people. I will skip through the rest of the slides. These are just um, slides um, sharing more about ISACA, which you can read on your own. This is about ISACA Singapore chapter, which has close to 3,400 members, right? We run weekly really sessions. And last but not least, this is my last slide. It is my belief that we are only as strong as our own ecosystem. And the only way to keep up with rising threats is to keep finding weaknesses in our own ideas. And the reason why it's important to connect with one another. I would really love to hear from you whether you agree or and especially if you disagree with the points that I shared and why. You may know something that I don't. So I look forward to con connecting with all of you to cross share, cross pollinate ideas, which is essentially what this community is about. Not least, um, stay safe and secure. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them now or offline via LinkedIn messaging. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. That was such an interesting presentation for us there. So we're going to um, take some questions from the audience now, if that's OK. So we're going to start with um, so small and medium sized enterprises. You know, they don't always have big, large budgets to secure their organizations um, with all these new technologies. So what would you suggest that they do? Well, um, take the example of zero trust network architecture I shared earlier. It is expensive, right? If you implement the full fledged zero trust network architecture commercially. Of course, the outcome is uh, micro segmentation of networks. However, if you can't afford expensive switches, you can actually look at host based firewalls. Not as absolute as definitive, but a similar outcome can be achieved. When there is an attack, you will still be able to limit the blast radius of such attacks. So if you look at human machine interfaces that are uh, they play a big part in the uh, ot environment um, they typically run off windows and windows comes default with the windows defender and you can activate the windows defender the equivalent of a windows firewall which is what it used to be known as and limit assessors between human machine interfaces to human machine interfaces so when there is a um, ransomware attack um, the ability for the ransomware to hop from one HMI, human machine interface, to another is constrained because of the firewall rules that you have deployed on the whole space firewalls. And often, it is not about the purchase of solutions that matters, but the configuration of the solutions themselves. All too often, expensive firewalls are misconfigured without proper rules, with a set all rules, for instance. Endpoint security solutions are not fully utilized, only certain portions of the endpoint solutions are being activated. And therefore, it's important if small and medium enterprises, um, they have a small budget to really maximize their existing solutions. And you know, we know hackers use the terminology of living off the land. We can also live off the land. Whatever that comes native with our operating system, we can utilize them to our advantage. Thank you. And just one final question for you. So with sophisticated attacks, you know, such as the solar winds or the colonial pipelines, do you think organizations can ever be prepared to future proof themselves? It is a constant battle. And I believe we are dipping the asymmetry mm -hmm. towards the advantage of defenders and we're trying to do that as much as possible through our ecosystem, through the collective wisdom of everyone, to public-private partnership. So we often talk about um, the asymmetry of attacks. Hackers discover one zero-day vulnerability, and they are able to attack multiple organizations out there. And they just need to find a loophole to attack, Whereas from a defender's perspective, from a blue team perspective, we need to check every single exposed surface to make sure that they are not vulnerable. There lies the asymmetry. But we can tip the scales 
by sharing information about attackers and hackers. When someone discovers, when they threat hunt for a, and discovered a new tactic or technique and shared it with the community, the rest of the community learns about it. So whatever that was a zero day, that advantage of the hacker is now a disadvantage because everyone is now protected against that zero day. So that is how, from an ecosystem perspective, from a community perspective, we can still be prepared to future-proof ourselves through the reliance on a closely knit ecosystem. And if we use the example of uh, um, technology on zero trust, um, it is important for us to um, look at everything in the holistic manner as part of governance. Good governance has to be put in place. Ultimately, how much security is dependent on the risk appetite we want to take. And it is important to go beyond just security by design to look at this, but also resilience by design. Like I said, breaches are inevitable, but disrupting the attacks before crown jewels are breached and having proper business continuity plans are all part of being resilient. So the way to be prepared to future-proof our, ourselves is not to prevent ourselves from being breached. Yes, that is important, but more important than that is accept the fact that we may be breached, but have the tools, the processes, the technologies in place to help us quickly recover from the breach and stay resilient. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm going to leave it there for today as we're running out of time. So thank you again, Stephen, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And thank you for all joining us on the CyberLive virtual stage. And we hope you have a good rest of your day.